titled Environmental Justice and Unsheltered Homelessness. And a special thanks to our sponsors, the U Health Green Team, who uh, provided some treats for those that are in person, um, as well as were able to sponsor today's talk. Um, today's talk is being recorded and added to our digital archive on the Eccles Health Sciences Library website, which houses speakers from a myriad of topics related to climate and health over the last four years. Before I introduce Dr. Jeff Rose, I wanted to say hi to Kara from the Office of Sustainability. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where the mic is. Hi everybody, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for giving me a couple minutes to speak. Um, I just want to promote our Climate Change Action Plan survey that is going on right now. Um, we'll post a link in the chat to our climate commitment page through the Sustainability Office's website. Um, and I've got a link back here to the survey as well. So for those of you here in the, in the room, come and, come and scan and say hi and find out more. But this is something we want to hear all of your voices, all of your input. We'll also have a couple of in-person and virtual roundtables focused specifically on climate change, health care, and equity, which I think all of you will be really interested in. So come talk to me after to learn more. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Um, so now we welcome Dr. Jeff Rose. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism in, at the University of Utah. His research uses qualitative and spatial methods to examine systematic inequalities expressed through class, race, political economy, and relationships to nature. More specifically, his political uh, ecology approach has leveraged the experiences of a 16-month ethnography to understand the experiences of unsheltered homelessness in urban parks brown fields, and public spaces along the urban wildland spectrum. Thank you for coming. Thanks so much. Um, I want to start out, and please, if, um, if anybody's having trouble hearing online, like put things into the chat, ask questions on the chat, um, make comments on the chat, all that kind of stuff. Thanks so much for coming, for the folks who are in person. Thanks so much to the people who are online uh, who, are, who are joining us. I really appreciate it. And thanks so much to the um, Eccles Health Sciences Library. I really appreciate having the opportunity to share some of this stuff with you. And I think one of the uh, goals that I know the University of Utah has had over the you know, past handful of years and we'll have going forward is to connect kind of main campus and the health sciences campus. And I'm hoping that some of my work and some of these talks uh, help in that process. I also really appreciate the, the title of, of these uh, speaker series, the um, uh, Climate Change is Health and Health Equity. And I think hopefully what I'm gonna do over the next um, maybe 40, 45 minutes, something like that, is make the case that in fact, climate does change health and health equity. Um, so I'm going uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview. Uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of a background on homelessness and how um, social scientists have approached homelessness um, as opposed to maybe nece necessarily like the, the medical side of things. Uh, and then I'm going to get into some research that I've conducted recently, some community engaged research uh, with some colleagues at the University of Utah and elsewhere. Uh, and I want to I want to uh, share all that with you all today. Again, please stop me, ask questions, chat questions, all those all those kinds of things. So I will We'll um, go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to start with this quote from, uh, from Jeremy Waldron, who says that no one is free to perform an action unless there is somewhere where they are free to perform it. And then Don Mitchell and some other folks have taken this and said, hey, there is no justice if there's not a space in which justice can occur. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the approach to this, that homelessness is about space and it's about access to space. And ultimately, that's where the justice piece comes into this, is who has access to what particular spaces and who is excluded excluded from particular spaces as well. Um. So uh, I want to, uh, many of you know this, I don't want to uh, you know, provide too much of an elementary overview of this, but I do think that it's helpful to have some common language when we're thinking about homelessness. And particularly, my interest is in unsheltered homelessness. And so there's, uh, in the literature and elsewhere, in, in common everyday uh, conversation, there's kind of two different ways to think about homelessness from a sociological perspective. One is to think about homelessness as an individualized descriptor. This is a set of behaviors, a set of actions that characterize somebody right so this might have to do with uh, the clothes that they wear this might have to do with uh, where they are in space and time this might have to do with the possessions that they have or don't have with them at any given time but these are a series of behaviors that characterize somebody and then uh, we can we can you know nominally call that person homeless 
The flip side of that same coin is that we can think about this less as an individualized descriptor and more as a, as a, um, as a, as a socialized uh, condition. So this means that we are all, all of us, the housed and the unhoused alike, part of a social system, sort of part of a political system, part of an economic system that has created homelessness. We are implicated in that system, all of us housed and unhoused alike. And so uh, in the literature, we see both of those uh, coming through. You know, that this is, this is a, uh, an individual thing. This is a uh, more of a structural or socialized condition. There are, of course, some definitions of homelessness that I think are, are helpful for us to go through. And this is uh, from the, Department, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. That is a very, uh, it's a fairly common one. We see similar definitions in, uh, in other kind of uh, the, the Anglosphere, England, Australia, New Zealand, places like that. Um, but it's an individual who lacks a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence, and includes a primary nighttime residence of either a place that's not necessarily designed for human habitation, or a publicly or privately operated shelter or transitional housing. And this is really the definition that I'm using to differentiate between people who are experiencing sheltered homelessness. So they're at, uh, locally that would be like the road home, or, um, or the VOA runs a couple of shelters, or or maybe even a, a religiously affiliated shelter or something like that. Um, or uh, or they're, they're sleeping usually in streets, in parks, alleyways, uh, uh, transit uh, corridors, things like that. And then uh, there's, a, there's an additional definition of homelessness that I think is important, particularly from a medical standpoint, which is to differentiate between homelessness, which is any particular episode of not having a fixed nighttime residence, and then kind of an ongoing series of episodes. And these are often accompanied by other um, uh, destabilizing conditions, health conditions, uh, mental health conditions, uh, ongoing episodes of homelessness. Okay, so um, I think it's helpful to just briefly walk through the literature on homelessness and kind of how we got to where we are today uh, in 2022. Uh, historically, uh, there was this idea of, uh, of, of the homeless subject as um, almost a slight romanticized version of the, of the single white male who was maybe a little down on his luck, but was kind of a vagabond, uh, traveled through um, uh, you know, through the country, maybe uh, jumping through trains. And we had this idea that this was this person who just moved from job to job, uh, you know, moved from community to community. And there's almost like this, this, uh, this desire, right? Almost like this sense of connecting that person to like the manifest destiny and, and this, uh, you know, kind of westward movement across, across the United States. Um, that changed uh, sometime, depends on who you ask, sometime in the late 70s, early 80s, maybe even the beginning of the 1990s. And uh, Michael Walsh and Jennifer Deere say that there were four specific causes that really increased homelessness beginning in the 1980s. So declining personal incomes, loss of affordable housing, particularly the loss of development of, uh, of public housing or, or subsidized housing, significant cuts in the welfare program that's usually associated with the neoliberal reforms of kind of Reagan and Thatcher and, and things like that. And then also just a growing number of people who are uh, kind of falling through the cracks of the system uh, in different ways. What that's led to is what uh, the literature refers to as the new homeless. And this is uh, almost uh, categorically different from that original homeless subject who was the vagabond, who was the single white male uh, living on his own and things like that. And so increasingly we see a much more diverse homeless population, um, in, including, uh, you know, you can see what I have listed here in terms of females, families, youth, LGBTQ, uh, folks who are uh, in, you know, engaged in some sort of sexual exploitation uh, in order to secure housing, things like that. But then also a uh, significant rise, and this is just in the last couple years, of, of people and families living in vehicles. Um, uh, everything from like established RVs that are kind of meant for a long-term um, uh, habitation to you know, the broken down Honda, Honda Civic or something like that where um, you know, you got a family of four living in a, in a small car or something like that. The bottom line is this is a very heterogeneous population in, uh, in 2022. And uh, by all estimates, it seems to be diversifying uh, as we continue. The folks who are continually re overrepresented amongst the homeless population, uh, people who are experiencing mental illness, substance addiction, uh, physical disability, prostitution, veterans, these are a lot of very kind of stereotypical um, uh, groups that we often might associate with, um, with people who are experiencing homelessness. The other piece of this that, that uh, is increasingly coming forward in the literature is this notion that uh, the state, uh, 
the, the state broadly, not the state of Utah, but is is vengeful, right? That this is this is a deliberate policy um, to to punish people who've who've made bad choices in their life. And so in this in this set of literature, you see that people are moved away, homeless folks are moved away from spaces of work and leisure and consumption, places that are heavily commodified in our uh, current environment, and they're instead spatially contained in particular sections of the town or even within uh, sections of the town in particular areas within those sections. Um, and then uh, there's a there's a there's a legality argument that's associated with this. Um, many common everyday behaviors become illegal by their uh, by their by their nature. So um, you know these are these are considered crimes of poverty that are associated with homelessness. Okay, so. Um, I think one of the things, obviously, we're in you know in the health sciences, and so uh, thinking about homelessness and health disparities, there is no shortage of literature that suggests or doesn't suggest it. Uh, it documents the correlations between homelessness and a variety of health uh, uh, problems and concerns and things like that. Um, and while those things are are always really uh, they're they're helpful and they help describe this population, one of the things that I think is um, is helpful to think about is is this a chicken or the egg kind of kind of moment is homelessness creating these difficult health problems or are these difficult health problems creating homelessness and to me that question almost like falls in on itself these things are so inextricably intertwined that it's hard to separate them uh, and really get back to any kind of root cause you know either by going back in time or going back in someone's health history or, or something like that or even you know from a public health stand uh, standpoint uh, thinking about it across a population or across a particular community um, and then uh, this uh, this definition I thought was was really helpful for me to think about it, uh, particularly to think about homelessness and health, which is uh, homelessness is where we uh, where we accumulate uh, of, you know the adverse social and economic conditions. Right? These are these are folks whose lives face multiple um, uh, difficult conditions, not just uh, one one particular one. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, moving across the country. Uh, my background, my academic background is as a, a human geographer, and so I think about lots of these things spatially. And so this is some data from about five years ago uh, that's looking at the largest populations of people experiencing homelessness. And you can see that uh, the numbers of people who are reported uh, facing homelessness are largely concentrated around uh, the coastal cities. Uh, and then I, I put Salt Lake City in here just for, for a little bit of a comparison. But I want to make a I want to make a point here, and I want to differentiate between the the larger homeless population and the unsheltered population in particular. So let's take a look at Philadelphia, which has uh, somewhere uh, a little above uh, 5,600 folks who are facing homelessness on any given night. This is all homelessness, and let's keep that number that 56, 5,700 folks in mind. And this is looking at uh, the largest populations of unsheltered homelessness um, as a as a percentage of it. And so when we look at the percentages associated with it, what we see is we see a pretty stark geographical divide here, right? Look at the East Coast versus the West Coast, or the Eastern portion of the United States versus the Western por portion of the United States. And we see that Western cities, or a variety of Western cities, almost have as many unsheltered folks as Philadelphia has total homeless folks, right? So not only are we seeing discrepancy um, geographically as homelessness um, is, is most likely located along the coast, but unsheltered homelessness is a distinctly Western phenomenon, Western United States phenomenon. And there's a number of kind of geographic and political factors that play into that. Okay, so what what is going on? Uh, let's get let's get some numbers. Most of this data is collected through what's called a point in time count. A point in time count happens in every every municipality in the country that receives federal funding, and so what this means is every in Salt Lake City it happens every about January 25th, 26th, 27th, something like that. Um, but communities across the country, uh, big cities, small um, uh, districts as well, basically go out and count everybody at one particular time. So they try to get a snapshot of what this looks like at a particular time. These numbers are incredibly, um, they lack validity, but they have high level of reliability. So uh, they're, they're good for looking at trends. So this is a little bit of, um, of some trends of the estimates of homeless folks across the entire United States. Um, and you can see uh, that bottom line there is the unsheltered folks. Uh, this is looking at those same numbers across the state of Utah. 
uh, which, uh, and, then, and then to zoom in even more, our local uh, COC, which is the geographic district in which these numbers are measured, so the continuum of care, uh, is, is, uh, is right here. And the, the interesting thing, actually I think there's a couple interesting pieces here, but one thing that, that I think is worth noting is that all of these trends are moving upward. Right, so these things are increasing, right? Maybe increasing slightly, maybe increasing a little bit more dramatically, and so on and so forth. The last thing I want to point us to is this number. Uh, at least the people in the room are here in Salt Lake City, and uh, this is from a couple years ago, but it's the most recent data that we have. Uh, and what we're looking at, uh, the point in time count tells us that there were 268 people who were facing unsheltered homelessness on a particular night in late January of 2020. Um, and I think that number is helpful for us to contextualize this, but one thing that it makes us do is it makes us have to disbelieve our lying eyes, right? Because if you spend time in the community, uh, depends on where you live and where you uh, move throughout the city and things like that, it's difficult to believe that there are only 268 people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness on a particular night in Salt Lake City. These are some recent photos from, um, from some of my research around Salt Lake City, and it becomes clear that there's more than 268 people um, who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. So um, let's let's get. So I want to I want to spend some time getting into my research, but I think it's helpful to think about this from um, from kind of a nature society perspective or even uh, an ecological perspective here. So uh, a couple of things that, that I like to think about when I'm thinking about this in terms of environmental justice is that people who are experiencing homelessness have daily lived experiences between themselves and the environment. Right? We are currently in an air conditioned room and it's about 70 something degrees in here. And tomorrow it's gonna to be about 70 something degrees in here. And the day after that, it's gonna be about 70 something degrees in here, right? And we can plan our lives accordingly uh, because of that. It's not gonna rain in here. Uh, if there's a storm, it probably doesn't affect anything to do with this particular building. And it may not have anything to do with folks who are having uh, largely sheltered lives, right? We all have places that we can go. I shouldn't say we, but uh, people who are housed have places where uh, they can go to retreat from the environmental elements. And I like this quote here that it's, an it's the fundamental uh, physical circumstances, exposure to the elements, the struggle to keep clean, the discomfort of bedding down on concrete that is the most piercing. It's those environment-human relations that that really characterize people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. But let's take a little bit more of a political approach to this as well. So we're not just thinking about this as an ecological thing, and we can say that local versions of unsheltered homelessness are actually affected by these much larger global trends. Right? So for instance, we talk about um, you know, homelessness as a series of um, you know, poor decisions that somebody made, or drug addiction, or maybe health concerns that they might have. But we also know that homelessness is affected by these things that are entirely out of all of our, well, I shouldn't say all of our control, but out of our daily uh, control. So we can think about uh, you know, housing markets, unemployment rates, uh, the minimum wage in a local area, um, the availability of health care, the proximity of health care, right? What's the accessibility of health care, uh, things like that. And then even local and state politics really filter into this. And so the other thing that we can, we can say is that homelessness, or at least the management of homelessness, is largely about um, the ideologies that are associated with what our cities, what our natural spaces spaces are supposed to be uh, clean, absent of people who are, who are residing in them, uh, things like that. And uh, there's some interesting research that's, uh, that's, that's come out here recently that says that, w particularly when we're talking about um, like parks and less built spaces, that there's an in... Um, there's a there's an inequality or unevenness on how we how we how we value those spaces. So, for instance, people who are housed, this is uh, these are spaces for middle class leisure. These are spaces for uh, sharing community, uh, and these are uh, often economic contributors to local housing markets or the quality of a neighborhood or something like that. For folks who are unhoused, these are spaces of privacy. These are spaces of escape. These are spaces of survival. These are spaces where kind of everyday needs. Are met um, and protection from uh, uh, various sources of of harm or, or uh, disturbance. So. What does this look like in practicality? So I want to spend a, a few minutes going into some of my research studies, and I'm going to start with this picture. This is a picture of a warm spring that I thought was pretty cool, and then one day. 
uh, this warm spring got a bunch of boulders placed in it by the, by the city of Salt Lake. And I thought, why would you take a warm spring, this naturally occurring uh, geologic feature that's quite frankly an environmental amenity, and why would you uh, essentially block it off so that people couldn't use it? And we know the answer is because it's, it's about which particular people are using it. Right? And those are, the, those are the concerns that were associated with this. And so I saw this as an environmental injustice and that, uh, that kind of sparked me getting involved with a lot of this stuff. And so one of the things that I really tried to think about was how does unsheltered homelessness sit at the intersection of these confounding dichotomies? So it's between urban and wildland. It's not totally urban, it's not totally wildland, but it's elements of both. It's not totally nature, but it's not totally society either. It's, it's in this intersection between them. And it's not totally public space, um, and it's not totally private space either. And so uh, the, the way that I've characterized uh, a lot of my research is that folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness often sit at the intersection of these confounding dichotomies. So uh, I engaged in a 16-month ethnography um, where I spent a lot of time with people who were living um, uh, near these warm springs and, and near this park and in kind of the, the adjacent neighborhoods and things like that. So that meant that I spent a lot of time uh, eating eating with them, sleeping with them, commuting with them into town, and, um, and, and kind of going about uh, daily, daily life and, and things like that. And over the, uh, over, the, over the time that I spent with them, uh, I, I ultimately took all those field notes and uh, interviews and things like that and compiled them into a number of ethnographic themes. And so you can see here uh, that uh, a, a few that I've just, I've just listed here, uh, positive and negative understandings of particular places, uh, place-based knowledges that were, uh, that were particular to those uh, spaces where they were, um, where they were uh, spending time, uh, the way in which they engaged in leisure. They had particular leisure behaviors and understandings of leisure, uh, particular felt stereotypes and stigma associated with their experience. And then uh, I really like this quote, um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a characterization of the folks who are living there, which is that they were entirely functional and could do uh, amazing things, hold down jobs, uh, make good decisions, um, um, even uh, you know, plan for the future and things like that, but incredibly fragile. So small um, uh, uh, disturbances had large effects on their on their lived experience. Um, and so I want to I'll, I'll share just a little bit about this. Uh, this was a this was a quote from one of the one of the fellows who lived out there, and he said, "Hey, this is my space." That's his space over there, but this is my space, I own it. And so this is kind of getting at that differentiation between public and private space. Most people might take a legal definition of this and say it's a park, it's funded by the government, this is public space, this is commonly owned. And he's saying, no, 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 this is mine, and I have territoriality over it, I have, um, you know, I have sovereignty, I have authority, um, things like that. And I thought that that was like a really kind of interesting uh, understanding, because as I'm like both critical of private space, I also know that that private space is the way out of homelessness, right? This is the way that people can exit homelessness. And so it, it, it's this double-edged sword uh, for most folks there. Um, of course, any time that there's unsheltered homelessness, uh, one of the largest, um, one of the largest factors that characterizes unsheltered homelessness is the threat of displacement. And so uh, one of the things that, that uh, I, I, I called up some folks and they said, hey, look, we know there's this, this group who's living out there and they're gonna be removed next week. Uh, we're gonna clean them out. Any stuff out there, we're gonna clean up. And I think the language here, the discursive language here is incredibly important, right? We are gonna clean up this space. Is that referring to litter? Absolutely. Right? There's litter that's associated with homeless encampments. There's uh, sometimes open defecation. There's sometimes uh, a bio waste that's associated, usually with intravenous needles or something like that. Um, but there, there are some like uh, legitimate um, um, uh, things that, that you know most people would say need to be cleaned up. But then cleaning works in another way as well, right? We're also talking about cleaning up the actual human beings, right? Society is such that we have, uh, we, we need to pick up, we need to clean up these spaces, we need to clean it up of any kind of visible poverty that might be associated with it. So uh, this, this, uh, this note was left on their tent, um, and you can see the, um, uh, the, the nice uh, move out. You gotta get out of here by Monday. 
Um, and so what, what, we can, what we can say about this is that removing the non-human litter and removing the human litter um, almost acts synonymously, right? These are, these are, these are, are, are in a, working in an intertwined way here. And it's trying to create this notion of some sort of environmental health, right? Our environment, our public spaces, our parks and protected areas should be welcoming to anybody as long as you don't stay, right? You are welcome in Liberty Park, just don't stay. Right? You need to come, play, do frisbee, walk your dog, go for a run, but then please leave. Right? And so those are the things that kind of characterize our space so that we have these, this, you know, this first nature that is, that is ultimately free of, uh, of humans. And then ultimately we have some sort of social health where we're free of visible, visible poverty. Um, and then on the, on the other side of this is there's this notion that we also have this growth um, and accumulation imperative where we have to have economic health as well, which creates this larger uh, kind of global health and then ultimately leads to the hillside residents uh, physical wellness being threatened or being supposedly uh, in jeopardy to, um, to them being displaced by the local health department. So um, this was a particularly uh, this was a particularly like devastating episode, but I think it characterizes a lot of um, I think it characterizes a lot of experiences of unsheltered homelessness uh, across our uh, across our, our valley and our area. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some local trends, some of which I'm sure uh, if you've been paying attention and reading the news, you might be aware of. Um, but I think these things help characterize uh, homelessness over the last few years. In August 20, 2017, uh, the... Uh, Salt Lake County, the Salt, uh, with the state of Utah, this very coordinated uh, action, uh, underwent Operation Rio Grande, which was a large police presence in the kind of western downtown area, so just uh, northwest of Pioneer Park for folks who are familiar with the area. Um, and uh, there was a number of uh, arrests and, uh, and moving folks uh, out, and this was uh, a, a very kind of uh, displacing event for people who were facing homelessness. The second, uh, the second big change that happened uh, in, a, uh, in concert with Operation Rio Grande was the decentralization of homelessness services. So uh, prior, there was a downtown shelter, uh, which was just colloquially known as the road home, that had 1,100 beds. It was decentralized into four new uh, homeless resource centers, gender-specific, age-specific um, homeless resource centers that are scattered throughout the valley. I think the Midvale one is, you know, you know, I don't know, 15 miles south. Uh, there's a men's about 33rd south. There's a women's about 7th south. And I'm forgetting one of them. The men's and women's. Yeah, the <coughs> yeah. okay. Yep, Th third west. Yep. Um, and, and, then the, and then there's the Youth Resources Center, which is uh, about 9th South and 4th uh, or 5th West. Um, and one of the things that we saw with this is we saw not only a decentralization, but we also saw overall decrease in bed availability. So we went from 1,100 beds, and depending on how you count it, we lost about 200 beds in this process. Um, again, we could quibble about the numbers because I think there's some, some ambiguity there. Um, and then the other thing that we've seen with this is we've seen an increase in unsheltered homelessness, people who are sleeping in tents and tarps and um, outside, but we've also seen a number, uh, we've also seen an increase in abatements. And this is where uh, usually health department, um, along with law enforcement officials, um, uh, remove camps and, uh, and, and displace folks who are, who are, who are staying in those, um, those spots. So I think uh, that led us to uh, to one of our first uh, the, one of the one of the research projects that I wanted to share with you, which was like what is going on during this decentralization process. So I worked with a couple of folks um, in uh, social work and uh, architecture and planning, and also in nutrition, and we asked the questions like what is going on for people who are experiencing homelessness, and how are they negotiating this process of the decentralization? And specifically, we had some questions about transportation. But I think we got at some of these uh, larger questions as well that, that ultimately help understand the change. So here is the here's a, a couple of maps around that are that are sized based off of beds. So this is the previous downtown uh, road home, which was right in essentially the heart of downtown Salt Lake City with 1,100 beds, and you can see the four. Um, uh, new homeless resource centers uh, and the size of their beds. Uh, so somewhere between two and 200 and 300 uh, per, per resource center. 
Um, and so, you know, one of the findings, obviously, was the, the decentralized uh, homeless resource centers were spatially distant from, um, from places where folks needed to go, right? It's harder to get places um, where, where we needed to go. We also asked them some questions around um, how do you actually move throughout the city? And so this is a, uh, this is a map that's looking at, um, the, the one on the left here is looking at the downtown road home. And basically what are the services or what are the facilities or what are the amenities that are within a particular walking distance? So, you know, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it might be. Um, and this is, on the left, is the downtown road home. And so you can see uh, the different things that are within uh, a particular area. And on the right is the new Men's Resource Center at 33rd South and 10th West or, or something like that. And one of the things that you can look at just visually is what is the concentric nature of the resource centers? Basically, how far can you get? What can you do with your own legs or with your own mobility if you're you know, using a... Um, um, you know, assistance, assisted device or something like that within that area. And because of roads, because of construction, basically the network is much less concentric, uh, in this case with the men's shelter as compared to the downtown shelter. Okay, uh, a couple other findings that I think were, um, that are important for us to uh, point out is that uh, people who are living in the shelters showed increased satisfaction with the shelters. There were more services, uh, the shelters were newer, um, they were appreciative of um, some of the on-site services that were located there. There's increased social services on-site, some increased like nutrition and other um, uh, aspects as well. Um, accessibility concerns, uh, basically went, went way up in terms of like what is available within a reasonable walking distance or a reasonable uh, mobility distance for, for folks. And then um, uh, the providers, we spent a lot of time interviewing providers as well. And one of the things they said it was it's very difficult to provide transportation services. UTA, we could quibble about UTA left and right, but um, was not necessarily catering towards uh, these, these new shelters. Um, so uh, that led us to, uh, to another study. Uh, this was a community-engaged research project that we looked at in terms of uh, unsheltered homelessness on, uh, on the Jordan River or along the Jordan River corridor. And the research question that we were really looking at were what are the needs, what are the concerns, what are the demographics, and what are the choices that people are making as to why they choose to live, where they choose to live in the valley? Why are, are, and, and more specifically, why are people living, staying, and encamping Encampments along the Jordan River corridor, as opposed to somewhere else in the valley, and so that was um, uh, the the kind of driving question that we had for this one. And so we did, uh, along with a couple of awesome uh, graduate students, Angelina DeMarco and Rebecca Hardenbrook, we uh, we conducted a number of interviews, 16 like uh, 30 to 45 minute interviews with folks, and we also did. Um, uh, a survey with 60 folks in order to get some quantitative data. And I thought I would share some of the findings from that. So this is looking at um, w this is looking at abatement experiences in particular for people who are living along the Jordan River. And so there's a couple of um, again there are 60 people here. And one of the things that we see with this is that uh, you know uh, 53 out of the 60 folks had experienced an abatement event, um, and uh, they averaged. 6.5 abatement experiences. So think about that. That means the average person who's living along the Jordan River uh, has been removed from that site six and a half times in their in their experience there. A couple other numbers that, that stand out to me is that TEH, which is the time experiencing homelessness along the Jordan River, uh, is some, the average is somewhere around 21, 22 months. That's a long period of time. I think a lot of times people think, oh, there's somebody sleeping here for a night, two nights, something like that. This is saying that the average is somewhere around two years. Do you have something, Paul? I did, but you just answered it with your... Answer. Okay, great. Yeah, and I mean, there's some, there's some interesting stuff in here um, around, not to get all statsy, but the, the standard distribution, or the... Um, uh, the, the distribution of these is, is pretty interesting, and there's like some bimodal stuff going on, but... Um, 
we, we also took this into the interviews uh, in, in these much more kind of conversational approaches. Uh, we were asking some of the same stuff and all 16 of the folks had, had experienced an, an abatement event um, at some point. And same kind of thing, uh, the, the amount of time uh, that these folks had, had experienced uh, homelessness along, uh, specifically on the Jordan River, uh, were somewhere around, um, you know, a little over a year, 14, 15 months, something like that. Uh, and overall homelessness, you can see anything from from 54 months to, to 88 months in terms of, uh, this, these are folks who are, who are long-term residents of these particular spaces. I think that helps kind of kind of uh, understand who's there. So we asked some folks uh, in terms of like, why is it that you're staying here? Uh, there are folks who are very interested in stewardship. There are folks um, who uh, were much less interested in avoiding authority. That kind of went against one of the hypotheses, one of the hypotheses that we had. We thought that people might be staying on the Jordan River in order to, uh, um, you know, maybe not escape, but like, you know, a little less seen from, from authority figures. And then we also asked um, yes or no questions around, like, what was your, what was your reason for, um, uh, for, for, encamp for being in an encampment? And some of the things that we saw was a really high uh, report for um, community was the number one reason. Um, and a relatively low number of the, the Jordan River was the last resort or that they were otherwise forced to be there uh, in some way. So some, some findings that I think are associated with this is there's a strong reported sense of stewardship and community. Uh, people are not necessarily moving to the river to avoid interactions with authority figures. And uh, the last resort or the forced thing was not, was not like, a, at least it was not a primary um, identified thing. I also see on the chat here, also they hate shelters. Um, yes, that's 100% true. Um, or I shouldn't say that. It's not 100% true. It's, it was a very common theme um, that, we, that we encountered. Um, a couple of other uh, uh, pieces of, um, of interview data that I thought was, was really interesting was this idea that community and safety was a really, uh, was a really key one here. And I've got some, some kind of key quotes from folks. The energy of the people here was welcoming. Uh, we share resources and food. I feel safe here. So we have this kind of shared uh, sense of togetherness, this sense of collective purpose and things like that. Um, I didn't choose to live, live by the river, but it was the only place to go. Uh, I chose the river because I love the trail and the river. It's so beautiful here. And so um, you can see that these are examples of um, of some of these dominant themes that were associated with um, why, the, why people were living in these encampments. Uh, a couple of other ones, where would you go if you uh, were forced to leave, if you were experiencing an abatement event? And uh, we see that a lot of folks would move to another portion of the, of the Jordan River corridor. Um, and then other people just said, I don't know. I don't have another place. Like, I don't, I don't know where I would go otherwise. Uh, a couple interview quotes we had here. Um, I was just displaced today. We never know where we're going. We'll probably move down the trail a bit and then come back. Um, and you, you can see some other ones. I don't know. I would probably move further along the river, but I'm comfortable here. Um, but you can see that displacement is uh, a very common theme that cuts across um, uh, people's experiences. Um, so what are some implications of this? I think there's a few that, that, that deserve uh, a little bit of attention. One, there's this kind of concern uh, for the conservation and the recreational preservation of this green space. Um, where uh, we see, And we see that both from the community at large, the house community and the unhoused community. Um, but unsheltered homelessness is seen as a, as a safety concern for folks. Uh, it's perceived, uh, the, the folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness uh, perceive it as a safety concern and people who, uh, um, who are um, who are, are nearby residents? The house residents also uh, perceive it as a, uh, a safety concern. We saw a, a, a definitive increase in abatement events and the threat of abatement, um, and that uh, is aligned with the, the decreased number of beds and the increase in encampments. And there are not very uh, many viable alternatives for people who are experiencing homelessness. One of the things that you can do in Salt Lake City, we can look it up right now, is you can look at um, a, a dashboard. Salt Lake City has a dashboard of the number of beds available at any given night. And I check it uh, pretty regularly. And uh, the shelters, those four homeless resource center shelters, are usually somewhere between like 96 and 99% full. And so um, there's, there are not the places where, uh, where we could go. Um, 
There's a quick question here. I'll pause. How did you make sure that your study uh, included multiple demographics in an equitable way, folks with disability, BIPOC folks, non-English speakers, people who don't read right, uh, the LGBTQ community, um, generally people who have larger systemic barriers to these types of studies? It's a good question. Um, I don't know that we have like a full, um, uh, a fully representative sample in that way. So we did, um, we did conduct a couple of these in, in Spanish with folks who, who preferred to take the study in Spanish. Um, and we did some kind of demographic break breakdowns. Um, we did not have a fully representative study of, um, you know, like across races, um, across uh, ability level, um, uh, we did not ask the LGBTQ question, I don't believe, um, but we, so in some ways this was, was more of a convenient sample than a, than a fully representative sample. It's a good research question though. Um, okay, so what does environmental justice look like? Um, we can think about how, how might we disrupt this cycle of dislocation uh, and disruption of people uh, who are experiencing homelessness on the Jordan River. Uh, we, can, we need to think about these folks when we talk about climate change, when we talk about exposure to particular events. So for instance, uh, and we, ha we actually had a question in the survey about climate change. Climate change is not, a, is not a concept that resonated with people who are experiencing homelessness. But you know what it did? Air quality. Uh, smoke events, um, the inversion. So if you can name specific things that are associated with climate change or that we may associate with climate change, people can identify that. But if you say, hey, how's climate change treating you? Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a little too neb nebulous for that to come out. But when we can name particular events or we can name particular conditions, um, then, uh, then, then people can start to articulate uh, levels of vulnerability and how it bothers their lungs and how they spend too much time outside, uh, things like that. Um, and I think one of the things that we saw was just the, the particularly deleterious effects of, uh, of abatements. Uh, the abatements themselves, and then also the fear or the concern with another abatement is coming. We are gonna be displaced from this location. I have to be hypervigilant, so that's a, a, a mental health concern, anxiety producing and things like that. But then also I have to like, I have to hoard my stuff, I have to be hyperprotective of my stuff. I can't necessarily leave my stuff for the day and uh, take care of my daily needs because I gotta make sure that my, um, you know, my, my, my stuff is safer or, or things like that um, and I, I'll maybe uh, leave us with this and with this quote for just a second here um, and I think I think it really helps us uh, think about the, the role of abatements and I'll, I'll be quiet and let y'all read that for a second And then lastly, if, if folks are interested in the full report, it's online. If you, I think if you, you can just stick your camera up to the screen if you're watching this, but that'll, that'll take you to the whole report. It's 50 some pages. And I believe uh, Glenna has another question about that. Um, and some of that will be in the methods, Glenna, but um, the answer, no, we did not collect that data. That's the easy answer. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, um, maybe I will, I will not go into this question, but one of, the, one of the things that we're working on right now is we're working on uh, where urban encampments are located within the city. So these are not necessarily just along uh, the Jordan River. Um, and maybe I won't get, but these, these are all the spaces downtown, if y'all are familiar, where, uh, where tents or other encampments have been located over the past uh, couple years. And we're, we're gonna try to run some, uh, some tests on that. And maybe I'll, I'll speed through that because it sounds like there's some, maybe some interesting Q&A. Um, Okay, so where, where, might be the, where, where might this be going? Uh, the question is we don't know uh, in terms of like future research directions and things like that. However, there's some, there's some kind of promising new directions here uh, along with uh, some other collaborators. We're really interested in, uh, in looking at if we could get some, some sort of hub, some sort of centralized location specifically for people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And what might this hub look like? We're gonna find out. We're gonna go ask people and see what they think it should look like. But we're imagining some sort of center where people can come and they can meet some of their basic needs that are, um, 
that are that are currently unmet. So there might be uh, uh, social services and, and various kinds of support. Um, we're partnering with uh, Wasatch Community Gardens in this effort. So we're looking at you know what is like uh, organic and uh, locally grown food that's healthy and reliable uh, for folks. What might that look like? Uh, providing things like laundry, uh, electricity to you know charge cell phones and, and things like that. And one of the questions that we have for this is uh, we're really interested in what are the health outcomes that might be associated with um, with with this hub. Like, what are the things that we should be measuring? And so that's something that we're going to be working on in the next couple of uh, a couple of months in a project that that's. Um, this got some initial funding from the National Science Foundation. Uh, a second one is uh, we're hoping to continue our project with um, with transportation and these decentralized homeless resource centers uh, in the Salt Lake Valley. And then the last one is uh, uh, doing a project in um, in Washington D.C. along the George Washington Memorial Parkway. So looking at like are there differences between um, again kind of a, a green space uh, urban transit corridor and uh, and homelessness and do we have any kind of comparative studies that might be um, that might be um, uh, comparable to uh, Salt Lake City as well. Um, Couple questions here. Katie Zimmerman says that sounds like what the Wigan Center does. Yeah, similar. We're hoping to do something similar to the Wigan Center. Um, and then, uh, to what extent is Mayor Mendenhall aware of your research efforts and your results? I don't know. Um, we have we we have been working with folks in the mayor's office. Uh, we've also worked with folks in uh, Salt Lake County as well. And so there's some coordination, but um, yeah, I don't know. We could. I'm sure we could do more. Um, Let's see here. So, uh, a couple couple of thoughts that I'll leave y'all with is if we think about um, if we think about where our homelessness where is homelessness located spatially, right? And we can think about this this notion of spatial displacement, like the abatements, people like physically getting moved from a space. And then we can also think about the discursive displacement. How are folks like pushed away or um, or or encouraged to leave or discouraged from being in a particular location, and that's where we really see the, the marginalization, right? When when folks are not uh, accessible into a community, this should be, this should resonate with notions of environmental justice, um, with uh, with with maybe you know like more common approaches uh, to to environmental justice. Um, some some kind of uh, final thoughts here. Um, in within the homeless community, we see overrepresentation of racial minorities, uh, the LGBTQ community. Community, uh, uh, indigenous folks, veterans, folks with a criminal history, and and um, and so on and so forth. And we're also seeing a destabilization of that like typical homeless subject, right? The single white male, um, and things like that. And from a research perspective, one of the things that, um, and hopefully this resonates with folks who study climate change as well, um, that homelessness is one of those classic wicked problems. And a wicked problem uh, is ones that don't necessarily have like all of the available data that you might want in order to address it. Um, you might have multiple stakeholders who are necessarily at odds with one another in order to address uh, potential solutions that are associated with it. That problem has uh, interconnectedness with other problems. So we can't, there's no silver bullet that's just going to uh, address homelessness. We have to address um, lots of other things in concert with it in order to uh, address uh, homelessness. And there's an unlikelihood of simple solutions as well. Um, and ultimately, if it's this complex problem, then we also need complex solutions. Right, we're not gonna we're not gonna um, build a tiny home village and solve homelessness. We're not going to um, you know have some new construction downtown with like some lightly affordable housing and all of a sudden see uh, no more encampments or things like that. This is gonna be this is gonna be a long fight. This is gonna be a long term process that we um, that we need to. Um, we need to bring multiple folks together. In particular, I think about researchers, uh, along with community members, uh, and lots of different stakeholders. Often, stakeholders who, who don't, um, who who are not invited to these kinds of uh, conversations, and also folks who are in positions of power, policymakers, folks. Somebody in the chat mentioned uh, Aaron Mendenhall. Folks who have, um, who have, who have policy behind them. That's how we're, that's how we're ultimately uh, going to make change. Um, 
So I, I, uh, I would be remiss if I pretended as though this research was done by me. This research was done uh, with lots and lots of people, um, including uh, local folks who are experiencing homelessness who've contributed heavily to this. Uh, there's lots of academic partners who've been associated with this and, and lots of community partners as well. Um, that's my... Um, that's my email address, and so if folks are interested in, in learning more or having a continued conversation, I would, I would welcome that. I'm pretty easy to find and things like that. So um, I think I would be happy to take a deep breath and respond to some questions. Maybe I'll start in the room, and then if there's questions on the chat as well. Yeah. I think it's really interesting when you talk about abatement events because not only when not only are local um, police or local authorities responsible for abatement events, I feel as though the environment and urban landscape landscapes are actually used in a sort of way to push people out. So like let's say if you go to New York, there's a bunch of spikes on mm -hmm. certain areas where people usually sleep. Yep. And I feel that actually goes back to like like a more like, um, do you know like what the difference between like brutalist architecture versus like traditional architecture? Yeah. So like I think if we created a space or like a urban landscape where we encouraged people to have more of a chance at living, um, instead of like pushing people away by using like harm. Yeah. I think we could build like a sort of stable community, but obviously like you were saying, it isn't a simple solution. I, I do think uh, what um, he's referring to is hostile architecture. Um, these are intentionally designed to dissuade people from using them or to even like punish people who, who do use them. Um, and that's a, yeah, it's a particularly like obvious and devastating um, uh, physical uh, interaction, but also just like, you know, the way that the, the message that it sends as well. Um, let's see, I'll take one of these. So. During your research, did you meet people who chose to be in unsheltered homelessness, or was it mostly a population that had no other choice? That's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, the answer is occasionally. Um, I would say something like 96% of folks want stable housing. They want some sort of space in which they can be. They want uh, the stability that's associated with, uh, with, with indoor space and, and the comforts that are associated with that. Uh, there are, just to be uh, completely transparent, there are some folks who, who, who prefer this, who have chosen this, and like they weighed out their options and they legitimately chose to, to be outside. Um, but the, the vast majority uh, do, not wanna, do not wanna do that. Um, and I'm just seeing a couple of, uh, thanks to uh, Dave Perrin and Kent Ono, that's nice to y'all, nice to, nice to ECU. Um, and I can't read any of the other chats. Let's see here. Oh, okay. So an obvious solution to me is more public restrooms, trash cans, to support them to live cleaner. I hear news in California has done this only result in, in digging down. Do you have insights on this? Um, let's see. So uh, yes, I'm. I'm very. Um, I'm very. Uh, much in favor. In fact, uh, the the last couple pages of that Jordan River report that I've uh, f you know kind of flashed the QR code for, uh, we get into some recommendations, and some of the some of the basic recommendations are um, uh, uh, trash facilities, restroom facilities, and uh, in publicly available clean water, more regularly positioned throughout uh, the Jordan River corridor. Our argument here, there's, there's always gonna be pushback against that. This says, hey, if you bring these facilities, it's just, it's just going to encourage uh, more people to, to be there. And um, my argument is you don't have any choice, right? People are there. We're not building enough housing uh, sufficiently. And so if people are gonna be there, you need to provide a place for them to use the restroom. You need to provide a, a space for them, uh, not only to get clean water for drinking, but like particularly at the early stages of the pandemic, washing hands, basic sanitation, uh, things like that. And then, and then having, having trash receptacles, not only regularly placed, but also um, uh, regularly serviced as well, so that they could, um, um, so they, they, could, they could have that. Uh, there's, let's see, when you say the way they weighed their options and they chose this, did you clarify with them what these options were and what these options could, if there were still more options, would they choose to be living? 
again, occasionally, uh, very, very few. Um, most people wanted to wanted um, wanted stable housing, wanted permanent living conditions. Um, they, uh, the, the folks that we work with, are very, very clear of what the shelters uh, offer. And they're very clear that there are limitations associated with those shelters, and they often choose not to be in those. So that's not what I'm talking about when I say that those are folks who are choosing to be outside. Um, I'm more talking about people who um, have the ability and the means or, or previously had access to housing and chose to, um, chose to separate from that, which, uh, again, very small percentage, but uh, the vast majority of folks uh, want stable housing and want to uh, continue to, to, to have that kind of security. Yeah. So um, I know that in a lot of these communities, um, there's like substance use disorders prevalent. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering if you, like if there's like any research being done on this or any efforts to incorporate like medication assisted therapies within these hubs because I know mm. accessing that therapy is a big issue. And like I was in Ventura over the summer and they have these hubs that like you're talking about showers and uh -huh. food and resources and then they have they don't have the people doing the therapies there but they have like ways to get you appointments and uh -huh. make so i just wonder if that was like any sort of thing incorporated in i think it's a, i think it's a great idea um you know the one the when i think about um like drugs associated with it. I think about Narcan and like having access to Narcan. The, Narcan's, like anybody can carry Narcan though. That doesn't require advanced medical training or anything like that. Um, in terms of the other stuff, I mean, I do think that's really hard. So um, Four Street Clinic has a, has a mobile clinic, um, which I think like really does great work. Um, the, uh, and, and then the VOA has a street outreach team that uh, occasionally will will work with physicians. Um, I don't know that we're, we're we're like I think I think I'm kind of like dancing around your question and not tackling it straight on because I don't think it's I don't think that's being done yet. But I think that's that's like the new place. Yeah. So a bit on the Medicaid assisted treatment part. Um, I know that for harm reduction in general, there are some programs that do outreach for needle exchange, for example, um, as far as, as well as walking clinics but also for things like Suboxone and Methadone. They have clinics um, around, for example, one of them is Project Reality, which is right across from the Women's Resource Center, um, that can also be integrated with other programs, like with our Adult Detox Program, with VOA's Adult Detox Program. Um, clients there can have, uh, in this case, Suboxone, brought to the facility and dosed there, for example. So there is some example of harm reduction and medicaid assisted treatment policies that are integrated with the existing system, but sometimes they are traditionally hard to access for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness or, well, not really accessing a lot of this is the nature of their, where they're staying. Thanks for that, that's helpful. So it sounds like some folks are, are thinking about that at least a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, this isn't my question, but the library does have no option kits. Okay, so if anybody would like to get them, it's two per person. It's um, uh, no question to ask. So if you do know anyone in the community who feels like making the trip all the way up here, and I know it's kind of restrictive, you're more than welcome to get no option kits from it. Unfortunately, we don't have Narcan because it is a bit more expensive to get them than you tell no option. But no option kits. That's not my question. My question was, um, did you see any benefit from things like the community fridges? Um, I know that they were effectively destroyed. However, yeah. um, did they have a positive impact, impact in the way that the people who created them thought they would? Uh, I, we, we did talk a little bit about that. I think the, I think the um, maybe the most positive impact was the message, which was like, hey, we see you, we care about you, we are offering, um, we are, you know, this is this is an effort, and so like that's what people responded to in terms of like their efficacy, and um, I think that was probably pretty limited. Um, I think there was a, a lot of um, vandalism and, um, but yeah, I, but I, I, th I think it's again like um, one of the things that folks say over and over and over again is that we are ignored, we are overlooked, and any policy that says we care about you and we care about you not only as a um, a problem to be uh, discarded, to, to be gotten rid of, I think is a, is a move in the right direction. 
Um, have you worked with any groups or talked with people who have been involved in some of the more non-traditional um, safe camping initiatives? For example, a couple of years ago there was Camp Last Hope over on 5th West near the Youth Resource Center. That was run by an advocacy group that wasn't city sanctioned or anything like that. And that sort of worked as its own social experiment, if you will. Yeah. Sort of an internal running out in real time example of what some of that could look like. Um, have you reached out to any of them or, or heard of any lessons that maybe um, they learned and insights that they had to how it played out um, un, uh, on an unofficial way? Yeah, so um, I definitely spent a lot of time at Camp Bless Hope, which was a, a large encampment. So that um, one of those slides where we were Essentially what we were doing, we were, we were counting tents. I think the highest number of tents that we counted at uh, Camp Last Hope was like 116. This is a large space and you know we're averaging something like two people for a tent. So we're talking about you know, somewhere around 200, 250 folks who are, who are living there at any given time. And um, uh, yeah, so we did a little bit of stuff there where we were looking at um, kind of the um, informal governance of the space. So, like for instance, Open Air SLC and um, Unsheltered Utah, Unsheltered Utah uh, have you know they really like put some resources into it. Um, and I th you know I have I have mixed feelings about those those kinds of spaces because uh, I find them both like intriguing and inspiring, and in, in that like these things are we're moving towards something like sustainability. Um, but my sense is that the city and <clears throat> other folks who are in positions of power have a very low tolerance for any kind of um, um, you know difficult behavior that might be associated with it. Usually, when these camps get quite large, and we've seen other ones as well. Camp Last Hope might be Last Hope might be the biggest one, but there was also one on like uh, Six West and Fifty uh, South, or like you know just south of the or right near the train tracks. Uh, there was another. Um, Anyway, there, there's been a couple of them, and usually they, they swell, and then there's something there. There's usually uh, a conflict between residents, you know, some sort of altercation breaks out. I think in one of them there was, there was a gunshot, um, and, then, and then there's a, a pretty heavy crackdown. Um, and so, you know, if, if, the, inf if the informal um, structure is successful, it almost breeds its own demise, because it's so... Um, it's successful, which then grows, which then almost means that then it's going to have one of these like chaotic events, um, a drug overdose, uh, and a, a violent episode, or something like that, and then and then the city cracks down quite hard on it. So, um, you know, I, I I I find those both like inspiring and um, and there's like a, there's a futility associated with them, um, unfortunately. And, I feel like I'm seeing more children on yeah. shelter. Yep. Is that the case? Absolutely. Yep. And that I think that's specific. Um, so one of the things, and I didn't get into it in here, uh, but there's some pretty clear data around uh, homelessness really takes off uh, in a community when uh, the median housing price exceeds 30% of the median income. It's it's like 29, you're okay. 30 you see this skyrocketing in homelessness. And so uh, Salt Lake City or Salt Lake County uh, exceeded 30% in like 2019. And so that's when um, uh, we've, we've always had homelessness and, and likely we always will, but that's when homelessness really accelerated in this, in this, last, uh, this, this last little recent bit. And so you know, one of the things, um, and there's, there's study after study after study that coming out about this, that homelessness is associated, the rise in homelessness is associated with the rise in housing costs. Um, and so um, I, think, I think that's when we start seeing uh, children, families, folks living in cars, um, you know some of the, some of the encampments that get quite large. Um, I don't see young people at encampments near as much as I do in vehicles, um, and so that's that's my sense. Um, I th the um, the various school districts in the valley do a better job of keeping track of that data than like the health department or um, uh, you know some of these folks who are re who are reporting for for HUD because teachers know where their students are sleeping, or, or at least have an idea of where their students are sleeping, as opposed to um, you know health department officials or somebody.
Um, I guess there's a couple questions here. Was there any accounting for how people needed? Um, there's not much information con concerning how evictions cause homelessness, and I think this is a glaring issue. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I totally agree. You can actually scroll that chat to see some of okay. the questions that were missed. Okay, right, yeah. You can physically walk up to the Oh, screen. I can touch the screen. Wow, okay. Technology, huh? Uh, what about established camps like at um, the State Fair Park? I think that's pretty similar to the, to the Camp Lost Hope one. Um, instead of four big shelters, we had numerous smaller ones throughout the valley. Would they be more open aside from a logistical nightmare? I do think it would be a logistical nightmare. I do agree with that. Um, but uh, I'm not, I don't necessarily have uh, kind of like an ideological commitment to either one large one or lots of distributed ones. Um, to me, it's about, it's about total beds. And so, um, you know, the road home before 2019 had 1,100 beds. We have fewer than that now. So, um, you know, uh, where they are and how they get access to resources, that's a logistical problem. But I also think that's a logistical problem we can solve. If Amazon can send me a package in 12 hours, we can figure out how to coordinate these different services. But um, yeah, we, we, need, we need more beds, yeah. Uh, speaking of the splitting up the big shelter into four smaller ones, did you say that the, the client satisfaction increased while also it was more difficult for both the clients and the shelters? Yes. Yeah, so both things happened. So essentially, um, most folks who were in the road home and transitioned to a new shelter, they transitioned to a new shelter. It's shinier, it had nicer paint, uh, the beds were maybe slightly more spread out. Uh, it had on-site services like, um, like, uh, like food, um, uh, s some limited like health services, not necessarily a physician, but like um, usually like smaller things. And then they would have folks, or they still do, uh, they have folks come in and provide services like um, little clinics and um, accounting services and teaching folks yoga or something like that. Um, so there's a lot to like about the new shelters from like an experiential standpoint. Um, but they also lacked accessibility. So then they couldn't get to places that were outside of the shelter. So the things that were available in the shelter were better, but the things that they needed to get to outside of the shelter were more difficult to get to. Yeah. Yeah. Do religious institutions such as like a mosque or like the Mormon temple, do they have a greater role at helping homeless or a homeless shelter? Um, whew, existential question there. Um, so uh, there are a number of uh, faith-based organizations that provide shelters. Uh, I'm thinking of the rescue mission. There's probably, uh, like, I think even the YWCA is like, you know, all, a, lot, a lot of those folks have like at least loosely religious um, affiliation. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul is part of Catholic Community Services, um, which is a large, um, uh, you know, a soup kitchen downtown. Um, and, and they offer a number of other services as well. So there are kind of faith-based um, uh, responses to this. In Utah, you know, the dominant um, religious organization is the LDS Church, and the LDS Church has, has made some uh, very large um, contributions to um, homelessness services. And those things should not be overlooked. Those are like massive uh, contributions. The other thing that I know about the LDS Church is it is, it is widely distributed, as in there's a ward like very regular, and wards are often characterized by like having large spaces, multiple bathrooms, um, and they're frankly empty a lot of the time. And so if a place like the LDS Church was really interested in providing services, providing shelter, providing support, uh, providing nutrition, uh, they have the infrastructure in place to do that in a very like coordinated and um, and, and like eclipsing way in, in, our, in our local area. So I think there's a real opportunity for, for um, uh, a church that's, that has that kind of geographical structure to it. Yeah. I know you probably get this question all the time, okay. but all of us like, at this point, like we wanna individually do something, uh -huh. but it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. So what would you and your expertise actually recommend that people do? <sighs> it's tough because there's, again, I'll, I'll say that there's no silver bullets. I'll, I do think there are some strategic ways that we, we can um, address this more efficiently than, um, than not. I mean, 
in kind of a daily behavioral sense, uh, be kind to people. Like that's my that's my big um, notion. I say that as a six foot four white guy, and I understand there's some privileges that are associated with that. But like nodding to people on the street, saying hello, being decent to people, I think that has a huge effect on people's lived experiences. That doesn't address homelessness, but it does address uh, the way that people feel on a daily basis. Uh, things that we can address from a more structural perspective. Um, I'm a big fan of mixed use and mixed density housing. So for instance, what are our housing looking like? Are we ghettoizing folks and saying, hey, they need to build something over there to, haul, to house those people? Or are we saying, hey, we need to build something in our neighborhood where we have mixed income, uh, mixed density housing right next door to me? Whatever that is, apartment, house, mansion, whatever, like what's right next door to me? I think inviting those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of services into our own neighborhoods is vitally important um, so that we have like a house next to a, a 20 unit apartment complex. And some of that apartment complex might be really nice and some of it might be uh, heavily subsidized for, for folks at a, at a very low end of the, of, uh, of the income. I also think, um, you know, from like a political standpoint, demanding that our elected representatives address these issues. Like these should be high on our, high on our, our list. Um, I was at a, um, a campaign event for, I think it was uh, State Senate. And these are, these are folks who are representing Salt Lake City. And like, demand that your representatives talk about climate change, demand that they talk about housing, and demand that they, uh, that they link those two issues. Like those two things are intricately tied to one another. Um, and we need, to, we need to demand that our, um, our politicians like have that level of complexity in their thinking. Um, I think increasing transportation access is huge. So like advocating for more bus routes, advocating for um, more regular bus routes, uh, advocating for a bigger free fare zone. Uh, the folks who are in our study talked very clearly about the necessity of the free fare zone. For those of y'all who know it's, I can't remember, 7th South to North Temple or something like that and a little bit east and west. It covers to the library but not out to Charlie Square, you know, like we need to expand that. When we expand that, we do justice. One of the things that I tell all my students all the time is that when we, um, when we increase services for poor people, guess who benefits? Everybody. So for instance, if we have a park, when we put a park bench in there, guess who needs to sit on a park bench? Everybody, rich people need to sit on a park bench. Rich people need to uh, use a bathroom uh, in a park. So let's provide benches, let's provide uh, restrooms, let's provide like basic services, transportation services, transit networks, things like that. And everybody benefits, but poor people benefit disproportionately. Right? So we all, no matter what your socioeconomic uh, class is, we all benefit, but poor people benefit more. And so um, this is kind of a, a call for us to, to reestablish a stronger welfare state, a welfare state to reestablish a stronger um, you know, public services network, things like that. Yeah. Um, well, well, let's see on my end. So in, in the scope of public health and wellness, and really how this ties in climate change too, how do you think that COVID has impacted unsheltered and sheltered homelessness over the last two years? Um, so I'm working on a paper that's trying to address that, and it's super unclear. Um, uh, the the place that I'm really interested in is um, is, is is basically the question is um, did COVID spread faster in shelters than in non congregate settings? The answer is yes, but we don't know to what degree. We don't know, or we don't have clear data that tells us. Um, what the outcomes of those COVID cases are. So like for instance, COVID might have been more prevalent in a shelter, but we're not sure if those led to like long-term sicknesses, uh, potentially uh, mortality. Um, the other thing that it did, the CDC, which is usually no friend to encampments, uh, put out guidelines at the very beginning of COVID, like not quite March, but more like April of 2020. And they, uh, they recommended against, they made a public health uh, recommendation not 
to have any displacement events and to make sure that encampments that already existed were, um, were provided with sanit sanitation and hygiene facilities. So basically, like, can you get hand sanitizer into encampments? Can you get clean water into encampments? Can you get a porta john into encampments? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, most cities in April of 2020 were completely overwhelmed and, and did none of that. But I thought that that was really telling that the federal government essentially said, we need to take care of um, unsheltered encampments at a, at a special level during this time. And um, what the effect of it was, I, I don't think we have clear information on that yet. Okay, even those who are entering homelessness for the first time as a result of COVID or financial instability that right. from that too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and that 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 uh, coincided with like the, the the housing crisis, certainly in Salt Lake City, but across the across the country as well. Um, let's see here. From a sustainability uh, side, do you have any recommendations for local governments? Hmm. I think my recommendation for local governments is beware of beware of simple solutions. Um, I, d I don't think there's any any single solution. You know, every I I work with some folks in the um, you know the planning department and like the design department, and, and they um, there's always students who want to like kind of design their way out of homelessness. Oh, if we can just build this, then it'll be fine. If we can just have these types of houses, it'll be good. And I always think that those are well-intentioned, but ultimately, like there's a reason we have a housing crisis, and it's not because we haven't thought of the right design yet. So I, I guess my my recommendation is just um, be careful of. Um, uh, be careful of any kind of uh, simple solutions or anything like that. Um, okay, yep, Dennis Ferris. The Old Road Home did not have 1,100 beds. It had 698. The difference is that they did not have a legal limit as to how many clients could enter the building, so many more people were allowed inside even though there were no beds. It got very crowded and unsafe as a result. That's a good point, and Dennis Ferris would know. He's, he's, a, um, he's a local expert in that, so that's, that's a good um, that's a good piece of clarification. Um, more free public transit. Okay, I think maybe we got them all. Um, well, for folks online and for folks in person, thanks so much for uh, uh, your attention, uh, not only to this presentation, but also just to this issue. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's vitally important for, for lots of folks, and uh, it's important for us as a, as a local community and as a, as a larger community to, to address these things. So um, thanks a lot for your time.